meeting started. It's 601 I have here. Um, and first thing we want to do is changes to the agenda. And I will tell you because I understand Karen Horn, who's with us. Hello, Karen, uh, is a, in a bit of a time crunch, as I understand it. So what we're going to do is we're going to move um, items five and six up and take the place of two and three. So two, three, and four will move down after item six. That's okay with everyone. Hearing no objections or seeing no objections. Uh, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, I think then we have three folks who want to um, speak uh, about the UPWP and the UPWP public forum. So we'll open that agenda item. And I would ask folks from the public who want to comment, um, please do so. You can raise your hand and be recognized, and we'll give you two minutes uh, to say your piece. Doug, did you want to go? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm not, the CCRPC sort of just fell onto my radar in the last week or two. I'm a neighbor of uh, Burton, the project that is they're proposing for uh, to move higher ground into Burton. And I'm one of the petitioners on the Act 250. And I received the letter that you folks sent to Act 250. And I'm sort of checking in because I was a, a little uncomfortable with, with that letter. It, I, I guess I, I don't know if this is necessarily the forum for clarification of that. Um, because it's about planning your uh, uh, your uh, your work plan for the next fiscal year. But I was reviewing the last two fiscal years, and both of those had things that seemed to relate to that project. And it seemed like they weren't really anywhere near fruition. And it seemed like there should be some restraint on what they're proposing, because those things aren't really in place. Is this a forum for that? I would I would think not this forum however comments to the to the rpc are appropriate um charlie how do you want to handle that do you want it to um reply to doug offline or wait until public comment and and deal with it then um yeah either way whatever works for you doug if you want to you know uh, engage in some email conversation um happy to do that or um, if you want to have, we do have some a general public comment period is item two. We can take your comment there. Okay, I actually wasn't able to find a, um, an, an agenda on the calendar. So I, I didn't really know where, where that fit in. So yeah. I'm happy to bump it later or whatever. Okay, okay. So, so if you don't so, mind hanging on for a bit, yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, who else did we have from the public that wanted to speak? Um, I saw another couple of names that I, didn't recognize uh, uh, Lori Smith. Did you have a comment for the UPWP? Yeah, I, um, I, I'm kind of in, in um, uh, alignment with Doug. And so, so my concerns are actually around what your plans are, what your perspective is around all the development along Queen City Park Road. And so I guess I'll wait until item number two also. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there was someone named Luke. I'm trying to find the list here. Ditto. It seems like maybe he's dropped off. Okay. Okay. Anybody else want to speak for public comment on the UPWP? Oh, the public forum. Public forum. Hearing none. So um, I think at this point, what we'll do is let's suspend the um, item and move to the municipal powers um, presentation because Karen does have a bit of a time crutch. And we'll come back to um, item five after we deal with item six. So Karen, uh, I'll turn it over to you unless, uh, Charlie, you want to do any introduction or anything? Um, yeah, I guess I'll do a little intro just because um, at our last uh, meeting where we talked about this topic, 
Um, and uh, John, I want you to know that we did hear you and uh, was hopeful to get uh, a dissenting opinion. <laughs> and uh, I tried uh, a couple of the senators that voted against it, uh, but didn't get a response. So um, I want you to know I tried, but if we can at least listen to um, what Karen has to say and then you know decide where we want to go from there. That's fine. Thanks for trying, Charlie. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And Karen, thank you for being willing to talk to us about this. Um, do you want me? Do you want to share what you sent, or do you want me to share it uh, on screen? Or well, um, hi, and thank you for having me. Um, if you could share it, uh, Charlie, because I have to do this on my phone because the internet in Moortown rots. So. Um, <laughs> If you could share it, that would be very helpful. Um, this, and should I just get rolling here? Sure. Okay. And I um, like your, your pitch for uh, um, uh, uh, internet service statewide. That's a good lead in. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can go on that rant for quite a while. Um, so, uh, we are a Dillon's rural state here in Vermont, just by way of background. And really what that means for cities, towns, villages, any municipality is that um, local governments can only do those things that the legislature specifically gives them permission to do. In a lot of the rest of the country, most of the rest of the country, uh, municipalities can do those things that they decide are appropriate for their local governance unless the legislature um, reserves some of that power to themselves. So a lot of states have self-governance authority for cities, for instance, or for communities under so many pop over so many population, uh, except for taxing authority or something like that. So and taxing authority would only be granted by the legislature. So that's uh, where we sit uh, right now. And for years, we've been trying to have a conversation with the legislature about um, ways that municipalities might be able to act more quickly and decisively on issues that are of solely local concern without having to go to the legislature for permission. Um, I did want to uh, point out to you that we have two different kinds of uh, cities and towns in Vermont. We have those that, uh, that are subject to the general statutes, and then we have charter communities, and you'll see the list there of the charter communities in Chittenden County, all together around the state, there's 60 cities and towns and 24 incorporated villages that have municipal governance charters. And a municipal governance charter will let you deviate from the general state statute in specific instances. If a town wants to adopt a charter or a change to a charter, it's put before the voters and the voters approve that charter amendment, and then it is given to the legislature, and the legislature has the authority to uh, approve it, to ignore it, to amend it if they see fit. And um, actually, the legislature has authority to act uh, to change municipal charters without any vote from the municipal voters. So the authority really is vested all at the legislature. Um, what we tried to do in the last session was promote a um, pilot program that would establish a governance commission outside of the legislative process that would allow for up to 10 municipalities to apply to that commission for self-governance authority in specific instances. And they would only be able to apply after their voters had approved the application at the voting booth. And then um, they would take that application to the governance commission 
and have a conversation really about um, what the implications are, what's going to work in that community, and um, eventually, hopefully, uh, secure permission from the from the governance commission to engage in that uh, pilot project. And the uh, legislation had at various points in its life um, a 10-year term or a five-year term. I think it ended up when it passed the Senate, uh, a 10-year term. So a local government would have that authority for 10 years. And any ordinances that were passed um, in those 10 years would remain in effect. But at the end of 10 years, unless it was extended by the legislature, the uh, self-governance commission and the pilot project would all sunset. Um, in the Senate, we had a very good discussion with the Senate Government Operations Committee. They're very supportive of efforts to try to um, give local officials, duly elected local officials, who are elected by the same voters that elect them, uh, more authority to address issues that come up under, um, under their purview. And one of the things that's been really interesting because that bill was passed by the Senate in 2019, and in the interim, we've had COVID, as you all realize, because you're all at home on the screen right now. So, um, and, and pursuant to COVID, towns have been asked to do a whole lot of things that they were never asked to do before. They've been putting together um, economic recovery projects. They've been working with, town, with um, constituent groups on housing. They've been helping uh, assure that utility um, arrearages are paid through one of the coronavirus relief funds. They've been uh, addressing all kinds of issues. And initially, we had towns that were managing groups of volunteers that were sewing masks that were providing meals to people. And in a lot of different communities, those kinds of things are still continuing. And we needed permission from the legislature to do a lot of things. We needed permission from the legislature to move to remote meetings. We needed um, permission from the legislature to actually move quasi-judicial meetings like planning commission meetings to, uh, to remote meetings after the COVID. We needed uh, permission from the legislature to post our minutes and our agendas in different physical places. Um, and then most recently, we've needed permission to actually mail Australian ballots to registered voters, to all registered voters, if the town decides to uh, move to Australian ballot for town meeting. So the legislature gave us authority in Act 164 back in the fall to move to all Australian ballot for this town meeting only, but um, they neglected to give us the authority to mail the Australian ballots out. So that's um, really what we're asking for, sort of under the umbrella of S-106. That legislation in 2019 was passed in the Senate, went to the House, and it sat on the House Government Operations wall for the rest of the 2020 session, which, as you know, um, ended in September. Another approach has been that taken by both Williston and uh, Winooski now, that is a charter change that was approved by the voters and says that um, any charter change that's been approved for any other municipality in the state may be um, enacted by either Williston or Winooski um, without having to go to the General Assembly for approval. And that does um, seem to make a lot of sense that if you've given authority to a municipality to uh, do something that you would um, then, having set the precedent, provide that authority to other municipalities that come along. Uh, the Williston Charter change was 
enacted last year, Eric can um, correct me, uh, and it was put into a bill and sent to the House Government Operations Committee, where again, it just sat on the wall. Uh, Winooski approved their charter change that this past November, so that will come in the form of a bill this session, and we're hoping that the House Government Operations Committee will take it up. So I'll just got a couple more um, items to point out, and then um, maybe we can have a little conversation about it. But if you go down toward the bottom of the uh, memo that I that I sent you, I have a list of some of the kinds of issues that local officials would like to have authority over. Um, on street parking and really if you're on a um, state, if your downtown is on a state highway and there are lots of them, um, on street parking is uh, subject to their approval. Speed limits, many towns again in downtown and village areas would like to lower their speed limits to 25 miles an hour, particularly in front of schools. You can't do that without approval from the Agency of Transportation and Engineering Studies. So there are those kinds of issues. Um, we've had towns that have put forth uh, charter changes to recall local officials under certain circumstances. And those have been adopted in some communities. Essex is one, I believe. And uh, they've been turned down in other communities, which sort of makes no sense. So that's... Um, really in a nutshell, uh, what we have been working on and a conversation that we would like to pursue this coming legislative session as well. I don't know if people have questions. I, I, I can't see, Charlie. <laughs> I couldn't see anyway, because it's on the phone. Yeah, let me stop screen sharing. Thanks, Karen. And so, yeah, anyone have any questions or comments? Bart, I see your hand go up. Yeah, my only question is if we know the, if the committee ever took testimony on this or did it literally like stay on the wall the whole time? Did it ever get discussed at any length or any content, do you know? The, um, the Senate Government Operations Committee took quite a bit of testimony from local officials. The House Government Operations Committee never even addressed it. We, we asked them to take it up several times. They never did. Other questions? John. Well, if I could ask Karen to give us a little explanation of what a lot of the rub has been. I know I can speak to the parking and um, speed limit issue where the state owns the roadway um, doesn't want a lot of conflicting things that can be dangerous um, on their facilities uh, without their permission. Also, when it comes to speed limits, it's not appropriate to lower some of these speed limits. The agency has long held a belief that you don't make criminals out of law-abiding citizens and try to make them drive at a speed limit that they will never do. Um, and I know the problems with that one. I, I happen to be in the transportation field, so I'm familiar with that one. But I have to assume that there are a number of similar types of issues with the kinds of things that I'm not overly familiar with. I, I know from my personal point of view, the, the roadway stuff's a complete non-starter, and, and I, we could talk about it all night. But uh, I, I don't know what any of the other ones were. So I have to believe there are similar issues with a lot of those other things. Um, and as much as I, I agree that our town should have as much control as they can, uh, there's always been a reason that this has been debated now for several uh, legislative sessions and never seems to go anywhere. And uh, using the the transportation thing as an example, if, if there are a whole lot of other examples, I can understand why a lot of the legislature is hesitant to bring this up. And, you know, and, and frankly, too, uh, local folks, select people get um, a lot of pressure from neighborhoods 
when the answer really should be no and they can't reach the no and they get a lot of duck and cover if you will from the state where they got to go to the state where the state's much it's a much easier place to say no when it's really a bad idea um so uh, it, uh, I would, if karen could summarize some of these things on the other side for us i'd appreciate that well, so, so these are examples of provisions that um, municipalities might be uh, approved for. Um, the, the way it would work in any given community is that they would um, provide a list of ordinances or, uh, well, essentially ordinances that they would like to have approved and implement. And they would take those to the self-governance commission. And at the commission, they would have that conversation that you're having right now. Is it appropriate to lower the speed limit, for instance, to 25 miles an hour in front of the school? Um, does it make sense in that community? Uh, some of the other issues are um, adoption of local option taxes in um, 16 towns and in, in, in 16 towns, there's a sales tax, local option tax. In 20 towns, there's a meals, rooms and alcohol, local option tax. And every time that somebody wants to adopt a local options tax, they have to go to the legislature and ask permission and really, truth be told, get raked over the coals by the Ways and Means Committee about whether that particular local option tax is appropriate for that community. And, and so that's always been um, a thorn in our sides. We have a lot of communities that are looking now at, um, again, transportation oriented things, but traffic calming kinds of issues. Um, we've got uh, towns that would like to provide more protection for their town forests, that would like to maybe put some different requirements around use of town forests, those kinds of issues. Um, and uh, there's a lot of new issues that have come up as a result of COVID and also as a result of the um, climate change that we're focusing on right now. The, the mayor of Burlington put out a message earlier today saying that, you know, in the last four years, as the federal government withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord and as the federal government um, restricted immigration and a number of other uh, of those kinds of issues, the city has had to step up and make declarations about what they're going to do around those issues at the local level. And, and that's been true not only in Burlington, but um, the mayor put out a statement about it just today. So, so it's front of mind. But those are some of the kinds of issues that we're looking at. Garrett. Hello, um, I'm thinking of something um, to kind of counter what John was talking about, which is um, talking about speed limits on uh, Route 17 on the Appalachian Gap in Buell's Gore. One resident of the Gore asked the state to drop the speed limit from 50, the state normal of 50 to 40. And the state went ahead and did it without any conversation with anybody living in the Gore, uh, the person at the time who thought he was all powerful as Gore's supervisor um, was never consulted. So there can be um, a feeling of the state's decisions being really rather capricious. And just it kind of the flip side of not allowing a town to drop speed limits in front of a school, but the state just deciding, okay, this is what we want for you people and we're not gonna ask whether you want it. So I see this as a real problem. So one of the attributes of, of something like a commission, wouldn't have to be a commission, is that you take the conversation out of the state house 
and you have you would have a group of people who um, are reviewing these issues on a consistent basis and having those conversations at the local level. Um, right now, what happens if you have a um, charter change that goes into the legislature, eventually um, 180 legislators get to vote on what's going to happen in your community. Um, and we we're not presupposing what the outcome of any conversation might be before a commission, but it would be a group of people who um, will develop some expertise and understanding of what best practices might be and what might work well in communities around the state. Uh, and that would be all to the good. Yeah, if I could, if I could just um, address Garrett's point for one po uh, second. Um, what a lot of people probably don't know is uh, an individual cannot bring a request to lower a speed limit to the state. In, in, a, in, in a Gore instance, in an uncharted town in Gore's, um, by statute, actually, the, the Secretary of the Agency of Transportation acts as the municipal government there. And the Secretary would have had to have approved that and brought Sorry, it to the committee. That's not correct. That is correct. They act for as the road commissioner for the but, unincorporated town. Uh, but nothing so, else as far as government goes. Uh, All right, so it's a little more complicated let, than that. But right. my point being is, and, and Amy can back this up if need be, is an individual citizen has to go through their their municipal government to make a request to lower a speed limit. A citizen alone cannot make that request to the state. But it was not know, done in this case. I was the so, municipal so, uh, government at that time. But please, let's 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 we move can on. Take this off to the side and move on, please. Bard, Bard, you had something you want to add or ask? Yeah, I would just say I've been down this road a few times here in Richmond um, with Route Two running through town and. We've had mixed results and it has to do with traffic studies as John described, there's a traffic study and there is a member of our select board who's throwing up his hands in disgust and leaving because the traffic study showed people are going faster than the speed limit. And to John's point, you don't wanna make criminals. So even though there's virtually no shoulder and there's people riding their bicycles and running on the road, the traffic study says there haven't been significant accidents so it doesn't justify reducing the speed limit. So there is an effort as sort of process and science is what I would describe as I think John alluded to. Um, but it is an awkward moment where when we discussed it in a couple of meetings, there virtually, there was nobody that opposed it. Everybody thought it was a good idea to reduce it from 50 to 40, but the um, transportation committee and the transportation study say, it's going to stay at 50. So that's okay. for better or worse. I don't know if it's better or worse. If somebody gets run over on their bicycle, it'll be worse. Thanks, Bart. Well, Karen. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. I was going to ask you another question, but if you want to address that, that's fine. No, well, I, I was going to say that you can go down rabbit holes on a lot of these issues. And um, I don't know that that's the best use of our time this evening, but. Um, I, I think more importantly for us is the, is the um, question of where you have those conversations and is the playing field leveled a bit between the locally elected officials and the people who right now are making all those decisions at the, at the state level and really have to, um, don't have to pay any attention to some of the preferences of, at the local level. Um, or one of the other items is health, safety, and rental housing codes. If a municipality wants to put those in place right now, they have to comply with a, an enormous um, uniform code book. And as a result, there's only a few, six or seven towns in the entire state that have ventured down that path. So, you know, there might be different ways to address those kinds of issues that would be very helpful in terms of for making housing affordable and providing additional housing. That's just another example. 
So Karen, it's six thirty. Uh, are you? Do you need to sign off, or do you have a few more minutes? I, I do have a few more minutes, although I have to go to my planning commission meeting, which is tonight. Okay. But I told them I would be late. <laughs> okay. I just have one, one hopefully quick question. You you cited um, Winooski and and Williston as having passed. Uh, charter amendments or changes that have yeah. to go to the legislature, but you list, I think it's 13 uh, towns or, or villages in Chittenden County that it, you say have adopted uh, governance charters. Yeah. Can you, so a uh, governance, uh, yeah, a, a governance charter is um, a document that, that uh, establishes where a municipality can deviate from the general statutes. So some of these governance charters, um, South Burlington's governance charter is probably 200 pages long. Um, uh, some of the other ones, Jericho, Westford, maybe are just a couple of pages long. A lot of smaller towns adopted charters not so long ago so that they could um, move from electing the clerk to appointing the town clerk. You had to get approval from the legislature for that. So um, they those towns, charters, address all manners of issues. And the two provisions that um, Winooski and Williston passed, if they were approved by the legislature, would be added to the charters that they already have. So those are the only two towns in the state that have passed such a such a, an item? That I know of, and okay. we don't necessarily get told everything, so. Great, okay. Anyone else have a question or a comment for Karen? Mike, I don't know if you can see Jeff, he does. I can't see him, but go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. I'm, I'm the only the alternate tonight, but um, I, I I would say that um, for as long as I've been involved in state government, which is over 30 years, this has always been an issue. And with a particular interest on local option taxes. Um, and that's probably why it's never gone anywhere in the House, because I'm not aware of very much support on the House Ways and Means Committee to have this local option taxes be a part of this. Um, Having been through it some, with some municipalities, it's the current system is pretty good. It's not that bad. The state's not been unreasonable. There's only a very few cities I know that have local option taxes that are their own that's outside of the state system. And having the state system for uh, implementing a meals and rooms tax or a sales and use tax, which like the, state, the state's constitution is the state's purview, um, has some ease in administration for the locale, for the people in the locality that participate in it. And I will tell you if local option taxes is part of this, it's gonna run into the same resistance it's run into the house for the last 30 years it's been tried. So take that for what it's worth. It doesn't mean you don't try, it just means it's gonna be an extraordinarily heavy lift if you include that. So I would just say that I've been on the other side of that conversation with Jeff for those entire 30 years. <laughs> okay. Send me another good idea. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments or questions? Just to thank Karen very much for uh, taking the time to join us tonight. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thanks, okay. Karen. Thank you. Okay. All right, so. We'll move back to item five, which is the UPWP public forum and ask if anyone new has joined us from the public that would like to make a comment. Richard, I see your hand up. How are you tonight? Can you, un there you go. I don't know if you have a list. I'm, yes, I'm here to comment on that. Is there anybody else in front of me? I don't want to. Nope. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and honorable esteemed commissioners. I do have a comment on the UPWP, if I may. My name's Richard Watts. I'm a resident of Heinsburg. And I have just three interrelated questions, if I may, and then a very short comment. Um, 
And um, my questions have to do with the fiscal year 21 draft mid-year UPWP, which I saw as sort of part of the, there's the agenda and then that was attached to the, um, this meeting notice. So, and my question is about the Chittenden County I-89-250 study, which is, seems to appear on lines 84 and 85 on pages 13 and 14. And my understanding, this was originally approved for about $526,000. So my question just is, if possible, <laughs> how much of that 526,000 has been spent? How much is the CCRPC and VTRANS allocating to spend in this document? My math suggests it's about 435,000, but I'd love to have that confirmed. And is this project expected to cost more than was originally proposed? And if so, how much is that cost overrun? Uh, so, Charlie, let me ask you, because we're going to be talking about the mid-year adjustments later on, do you want to take it then or address it now? Or Alani or whoever? Yeah, either one is fine. Um, and uh, Alani may be able to give me a more precise answer. Uh, Richard, I think the answer to, I'm not sure if I got every single question. Uh, is it more? Yes. Um, I do think we're probably approaching... I'm, if I was going to guess what it might ultimately be, it's going to be 800,000 maybe. Um, and I think it's a big number. It's hard for me to put a number like that out there. Um, and we're sharing that cost. Uh, VTrans is paying a portion of it, I think close to a third. Um, and I think the real issue, um, if I can answer a question you didn't ask, which is why, um, and uh, is that really we're uh, finding ourselves in a situation where there are a lot more questions and analysis that needs to be done to be able to come up with good answers for the public, for this body, for South Burlington City Council, for VTRANS. And so um, I think we're trying to do a little bit more deeper dive to, to better answer questions and resolve issues and not hand over a study to VTRANS that uh, kind of creates more problems than it solves. So it is definitely bigger, um, a bigger budget for sure. Um, I hope it's also more effective at resolving issues by the time we get done with it. And I know we, we can have a debate about the, uh, the why and how <laughs> outside of that, but that is what's in this uh, UPWP update. And I can't remember the exact number um, I think, and I'm blood, trying to blow up that screen, but is it like 380,000 in this fiscal year, Elaine? Um, I think so. I, I'm just trying to find the number. Uh, what um, I know is that um, we are asking for approximately $160,000 in Peel funds uh, uh, in fiscal year 21. So that will take us to the end of June. It, and Eleni, you said 100, your audio cut out, an additional 160,000. An additional 160,000, I'm sorry. My microphone is not working very well. Uh, yes, and this is, uh, as Charlie said, this is mainly because we are doing a lot more evaluation based on questions from the public, based on, based on questions from uh, our advisory committee, especially. Uh, on the uh, interchange task for this study. And we're going to be coming out uh, soon with some results of that, of those interchange evaluations. So again, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I have a short comment, but the, I, my math is it's about $435,000. So in what Mr. Baker is suggesting that the cost overrun here is over a quarter it's 526 to something like 800,000. So that would be 260,000 or so. Yeah, and I'm speculating a little bit about where we might end up in the next fiscal year as too, Richard. Yeah, that, the, the study will go until probably the beginning of 2022. 
right? So we still have another year of this study. So well, we're gonna move into the next fiscal year. And I think that's what Charlie was talking about, not just for this fiscal year. So uh, Richard, I can just give you specific numbers outside this forum, if you would sure. like, I'd be happy to. Uh, I don't have them in front of me right now. Sure. So, okay, and then just if I may, Mr. Chairman, just a short statement, you can see where I'm headed clearly, but um, I think that given what has happened in this country since this project was first developed, that the commissioner should really think about a pause. And we've just heard that it's over $250,000 already over what was anticipated spending. And we should just take the time to think about it. According to the document's description, the planning project is going to study things like new and expanded interchanges and develop an implementation plan for making those investments. And if I look at the CCRPC's Metropolitan Transportation Plan 2017-2050, a short list of just four of those improvements, if any of those were um, recommended for implementation, are over $100 million. And that's, you know, in dollars that are going to change. So probably everybody on this call is here remotely. And the pandemic has brought an enormous change in teleworking and how we travel and how we think about travel. And I just think it might make more sense rather than tacking that on to a study that started with a different mission to pause the study and really rethink where we're headed. Look at what's happening around us and think about what types of investments we want to make. Um, you know, I've written about this before, but I think the study is framed in a certain way, and that's the biggest concern I have. It, it's framed in a way that we have to fix the interstate if we're going to solve this problem of moving people around. And the solutions are all car-centered. Instead, given this moment in time, I think it would make sense to pause the study and to see if there are actual TDM solutions solutions that invest and enable people to drive less like we see is happening all around us. And I do think it's at odds with the really far thinking ECOS plan that talks about other types of investments. And just lastly, and thank you for this time, planning, planning is meant to be the guidance of future action. That's what planning is about. And I think we should plan the future we want and that future might be in different types of investments as we look at what's happening around us. And this might be a time just to take a pause before spending you know, almost half a million dollars here in the next fiscal year and really think about where, what we wanna do with the study. So thanks for the time. I, I know many of you, happy inauguration day. And uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Anyone else in the public that wants to make a comment about the UPWP? Charlie, let me know if you see anyone. I can't see anyone else. Jeff, hang on for just a second. I know you're the alternate tonight. I guess there's no one from the public. So Jeff, go ahead. Um, I just want to take issue with Mr. Watts's characterization that the study has gone over budget. The only reason that we're allocating more money to it is to address many of the concerns like the ones that Mr. Rotz has um, raised to make sure that they're fully considered when we plan what's something that is an absolutely critical piece of infrastructure to the whole planning region. So I just want to make sure that it doesn't come across that the money that we're spending is wasteful or something that we were guilty of not planning well for. But when we get um, input in, and it requires further analysis, we would be foolish not to undertake the further analysis so we come out with a high quality product. And I just wanted to make sure that the record didn't reflect it was just a cost overrun. It's the cost of doing additional analysis for a good plan. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So anyone else on the commission wish to make a comment? Mr. Chair, from my, I think this is an action item under number eight, so we'll be okay. able to discuss it there as a as a board oh okay so then we will close the public uh forum at this point and move on and move back to um public comment that we skipped over before 
So I'd ask if anyone from the public has a comment on anything not on tonight's agenda. Doug? Um, okay, so I, as I started to say earlier, I, I'm here because I'm of the letter that was sent out regarding the development of the Burton Project with Higher Ground. And I was curious about how that letter was sent out. Was it solicited or is that something that uh, um, you just sort of send out a, in a pro forma way? And because uh, I had some, there were a couple of things in that that didn't seem like they related to the pro, it seemed like there are certain things, some comments that, that uh, CCRPC um, made that didn't really relate to the situation here. And the two things that I wanted to bring up were in your uh, previous fiscal years, 2020 and 21, 2021, the work plans, um, you spoke about sidewalks and about wastewater. And neither of those issues seem to be addressed and they're pretty big issues with that project. Is this the time to bring this up? Um, I, I think so. Uh, okay. To answer your, your first question, um, and Charlie or Regina can jump in and correct me if I misstate here, but uh, we are asked to comment on Act 250, um, this type of thing. And that's what we're responding to, okay? Uh, in terms of, of what's in the letter, um, you know, this, this goes through the executive committee and we had a discussion of it. And uh, the focus of our comments is really transportation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we comment on. We recognize as a group that there are, are likely other issues that come up, but we did not comment on those. And again, I'm looking for Regina or Charlie or anyone on the executive committee who'd like to, to jump in and, and um, correct anything I misstated, but, but that's where we were from the executive committee's standpoint. Could, could I elaborate on my concerns then? Sure. Okay, so in, in your um, uh, point number two, that the proposed project is serviced by municipal water and sewer, which it is, it's also located on bus lines and is within walking distance to many services and jobs. Uh, the bus service is only until 6.40 p.m. And it's a concert venue. So many of the concerts aren't going to be getting out until 2 a.m. So it really doesn't have bus access. Um, and in terms of um, walking distance to service and jobs, in your uh, work plan for 2020 and 2021, you commented specifically on that neighborhood in terms of sidewalks and that um, you're in the process of doing a um, uh, scoping, Queen City Park Road sidewalk scoping, and acknowledge that there's a 700, 700 foot gap missing along that section to connect sidewalks. So there's no way to get from the Burton property to the minimal sidewalk that crosses the one lane railroad bridge. And the what's surprising is that I don't know how many millions of dollars Burton spent to repave Queen City Park Road this year, but there was nothing done with sidewalks. And so that, that's sort of been kicked down the road. And I'm just wondering, because you've been working on the scoping and uh, finding a preferred sidewalk alternative for two years of work plans. And it seems like that should come up in suggesting that this is a good place for a concert venue, especially with Burton talking about wanting to have uh, pedestrian bicycle and uh, mass transit access. Regina, do you want to Jump in, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah, so um, just to confirm, Mike, you are correct. We are a statutory party to Act 250, so we are notified of all applications and we uh, participate in those that go to hearing. Um, so we have two specific things that we tend to look at um, when we're looking at Act 250 projects. One is does the project fall in line with our future land use areas. Um, that's a pretty broad scope. Um, it is an area planned for growth. Um, so that's really what that first part of the letter is about. And then we do look more specifically at the tra traffic um, impact assessment. Um, and it's uh, really what the other part of the letter is about in terms of whether we think from a, from a vehicle traffic perspective, 
whether there's going to be um, um, any impacts beyond what the traffic impact study is calling for and for mitigation of those impacts. Um, the sidewalk and the bus service are um, two good points um, and we can we probably actually have time to relook at those two issues if um, if the executive committee would like to when we get um, back to that point in time um, because the hearing has not yet been scheduled yet I don't believe or if it has it's we probably still have time to participate in that um, yeah so I think that's could I say one more point to the to the traffic study? Um, there's a pretty active community group that's been trying to participate in this, um, and it's we've had we've not had a lot of success. But I think it would be w worth a visit for the uh, for your committee to take a look at just the road access because they do have a pretty elaborate traffic study. But the reality is there are major pinch points adjacent to the site. There's a one lane railroad bridge that's supposed to take half of the traffic and Home Avenue is supposed to take the other half and there's a railroad crossing on Home Avenue that there are frequent trains at night. So I, I think that it would bear further investigation and also um, the impact on the neighboring community, which when you look at the vision statement for the um, CCRPC, they talk about uh, quality of life. You talk about quality of life, brother. So I, I appreciate your time and I, I appreciate your consideration on these points. Thank you, Doug. Um, any other comments from the public? Um, I, I'd like to make a comment and I can't get my video to work tonight. This is Laura Waters. I'm on Lori Smith's computer. Can okay. you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Hello? Go ahead, Lori. Or Laura. Um, shall I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm sorry. Yeah. So I just I just wanted to um, kind of uh, 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 build a little bit on what what Doug was saying tonight because if you look at all the Chittenden County Ecos plan sections that could apply to this project, a lot of the um, the sections were. Uh, ignored in the Act 250 application and also in any of the review that, that was done um, by whoever uh, had written this letter. But I thought it was really interesting that um, one of the things that somebody brought up tonight was that uh, apparently um, Moreau Weinberger was talking about uh, climate change and the Paris Climate Accord and all of that. But the whole aspect of shoving between five and 600 cars to this venue, that's the only way that people have to get there, that nobody's taking into account the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions, the environmental impact of the lack of transportation, alternative transportation infrastructure for this venue. Um, Burton talks about uh, wanting to have bicycling and wanting to have uh, people walk there, but there's absolutely no infrastructure whatsoever that's safe for anyone to do that. And if you look at the active transportation plan, page 41 of, of your report, you look at that and the impact of, of accidents from pedestrians and bicyclists along Route 7 and that and that spreads out into um, on, along Pine Street and down uh, Flynn Avenue, which is where people will be trying to access this venue. It's 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 a it's very very high. Uh, if you I don't know the the crash frequency in some cases are at the very maximum of the crash frequency along this road, which is where people are going to be trying to get across. So the fact that that the entire kind of ecosystem of the transportation aspect of trying to get people to walk, trying to get people to ride bicycles, trying to figure out any other kind of transportation aspects of getting people back through these small secondary neighborhood roads to a venue that has been approved by the city of Burlington for 1500 people, 
They are, they've estimated that three people per car will travel and we all know that people don't carpool like that and their own um, public works, one of their public works engineers said that he would estimate it at 2.5 people which makes 600 cars for a, a maximum concert. It's, it's just, it's an untenable situation for those of us who live back here. And I would urge you to look at the transportation aspects of this the fact that it is it is completely ill it's a completely ill conceived project that also if you look at the other criteria that would apply to this that there were many criteria that were ignored uh the infrastructure the energy public safety etc that all apply under the ecos plan that all of these uh, areas should be addressed in another letter to Act 250. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public want to make a comment? Charlie, since I can't see anyone, let me know if there is someone. Yeah, I'm not sure. I saw um, uh, Michael's iPad. Michael, are, are you here to make a comment? You're good? Or you're muted. Michael, I think you're talking, but you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I live in Central, uh, on Central Avenue in Queen City Park. And I've reached out um, to the South Burlington Police Department to to get uh, records for accident frequency up at Route 7 uh, and uh, Queen City Park Road, as well as um, down uh, around Home Avenue. Well, that's Burlington. But so we'll have that information soon for the last four or five years, which would be interesting to share, which I am happy to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you Michael, what was I your I don't last think name? it's been really looked at carefully. And uh, Turner. Turner. Oh, thank you. Anyone else from the public? I guess not. Okay. So we'll close public comment and move on to the uh, consent agenda. We have a couple of items there. I'm looking for a motion. Uh, I'll move Jim Donovan. Is there a second? Second, Barbara. And okay. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Okay. Next, we have approved the minutes of November 18th, 2020 meeting. Uh, I'll meeting. make a motion approve. This is Jim. Jim. Darren, I'll second. Are there any comments or corrections to the minutes? Technically, this probably should come from Essex, but um, what I did notice is under the uh, attendance, we had Elaine as the alternate, and then Jeff was the um, member, but in the minutes, the, the written part of the minutes, Jeff mentioned that he was the alternate and then Elaine was the member. So should the uh, the those present rec uh, correspond to the actual voting then uh, of the members? Uh, I'm the appointed member, Catherine, but that's why I said and volunteered that even though they, I'm the appointed member and Elaine is the alternate, I was serving as the alternate at that meeting and I did so again tonight just to make that clear. Good because I, I, I just you know wanted to you know confirm that that's what it was whether we needed to whether it needed to be changed in one way or another or just let the minutes show what they were. I didn't know the you know because don't want to have things confusing. Well it's just so that when Elaine votes and makes motions even though she's the alternate she's recognized as being the representative for the community that night. I was prevented from making the motion to approve the audit as I've done the last 19 years. Right, exactly. Because I was the alternate list. <laughs> so 
Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> you are you you are the finance guru. <laughs> and any other comments or or corrections to the minutes? That was good. Other than that, I just wasn't sure. Okay. Hearing none, then I will ask those in favor of the motion again to either raise your hand or say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Garrett abstains. Okay. Motion passes. All right. Next we have, got to get back to my agenda here. We are on, uh, let me see, minutes, uh, 2021 policy participation review. Charlie, is this you? Okay, um, until Regina, you know, seizes it. But um, so, but actually, uh, just to give credit to Regina for putting this together, you have a, uh, a document in your packet that describes or lists about, um, so I'm going to the second page, 13 different items policy issues uh, that uh, from a staff perspective, we think we should be tracking. Um, if you remember, I don't know, going back six, 12, maybe 18 months ago, um, we committed to kind of keeping this list and updating it with you every six months or so. Uh, so this is kind of our beginning of the session list. Um, so if there's things on here that you feel like um, we should stop tracking, happy to hear that. Uh, but probably more on the side of if there are things that you're aware of uh, percolating in the legislature that we should be paying more attention to, this would be a great time to let us know and we'll add it to this list. Um, so uh, with that, happy to take any questions or comments on the list or, or things that should be added or deleted. Jim. Um. We have, uh, in the past, we were helping with the uh, opioid crisis and some of the health-related issues with that. Yep. Uh, I do not know if that is still an issue with the legislature right now or if we are still involved in any of those things, but that's something I saw that was not on here. And if either we're still involved or the legislature might be thinking about it. I think that's something that might be added to our list. Thank you. That's, that's good. Yeah. The, um, the opioid Alliance that we were staffing a few years ago is kind of, uh, closed the books on that particular staffed effort and has evolved into more of a Chittenden County public health Alliance. Um, so maybe that's something I should add just so we can kind of update you on that. Um, and that's still a little bit in the storming to forming stage. So, uh, but I'll add that to the list. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? Don't see any. Good, yeah, and we oh, did try Sharon. to turn it down a little bit. Yeah, Just Sharon. Quickly, Charlie, I was wondering about the um, the RPC bill and the 117 changes, the climate response plan legislation. Yeah, there's, um, I, don't, I don't know what bill number that is this year, Sharon, but um, I don't know if you do. Um, there is a small bill that, um, asks us to work a little bit with the health department on climate response and also uh, talks a little bit about um, being a resource to hospitals uh, when they do their uh, community health needs assessments. Um, yeah, so I don't know, uh, it did, I think it passed the Senate last year, um, but did not, uh, you know, well, I, yeah, I think that I think that was in early 2020. I think it passed the Senate early in the session, but didn't COVID hit, <laughs> didn't go anywhere in the House. Um, yeah. And I, I really am not expecting expecting any action on it this year because um, the same what happened in the House was it was not related to COVID response or recovery, yeah. um, and so they uh, pushed it off. Um, I'm kind of I think that's Sharon what was going through my mind. I'm not expecting that to really move forward, but. Uh, we'll put it on the back burner to see if it does. Okay, because it was reintroduced again this session. Yeah. 
Thank you. And I think it's S19. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Hearing none, let's move on to UPWP. So um, I, I am not going to open that document and torture you all with the, the very small type size. Um, I'm, and I apologize for the lateness in which you got the document. Completely my oversight. I, I told the staff everything was in the packet and uh, except for that little detail of the work program and the budget. Um, so totally my fault, um, even though I think Amy probably, you know, it looks like it's her fault because she sends an email, but it's not. Um, so um, in the, uh, let me talk about the budget first. Um, this is for those of you, you know, who haven't been on the board too long, in the midpoint of the year, we try to right size our budget um, now that we have more accurate information through six months of the year. And we also typically have um, a number of things that have come up since last spring uh, that that uh, have been added to our work program. Um, so if you look at the budget, there's things like the uh, the EDA planning grant for the West Central SEDS um, is a new contract that we're doing with uh, adjoining regions uh, to do a, a comprehensive economic development strategy. You'll see uh, a, th a project called MTI Green Ride Bike Share. Uh, VTrans made some additional funding available to work on TDM projects. We got another grant there to work on um, bike sharing and expanding that. And then um, you'll see some other things that came uh, that were COVID response items under emergency management and health down near the bottom. Um, so there's some changes in uh, revenue stream reflected there. Um, I think it's about a $300,000 increase on the revenue side. And then on the expense side, you know, we're able to tighten things up uh, a little bit more, particularly on salary and benefits. Um, you know, one of the big questions that we have going through to the mid-year is always, um, how much will health, in health insurance go up? Um, and you'll see a big savings, well, you know, uh, about 5% savings on the benefits, uh, really because uh, we kind of adjusted our health care plan in a way to make it flat, might even be a couple dollars less, uh, which never happens, but that's the situation we're in right now. Uh, so uh, we're gonna thank, be thankful for that. Um, and in the end, um, and there's one other thing that I'll note is changed and it's down near the bottom. Um, and I know um, you all appreciate when I start talking about indirect rates, um, but down here at the bottom, you'll see a little cell highlighted in FY21 um, that has an indirect rate of 81.5. We, and this is mostly uh, Forrest and I kind of looking at um, our indirect expenses and feeling like we might be over collecting a little bit on our indirect rate. And so uh, we got approved for 83% at the beginning of the year. We're proposing to notch it down to 80% for the second half of the year for an effective 81.5% indirect rate for the whole year. Um, and that, and I, I mentioned that because I was about to go to the bottom line and you'll see the bottom line is down about 12,000. That is not because our revenues are down or our expenses are up, it's really because we're adjusting the indirect rate down a little bit so that we don't over collect. And uh, we're trying to reduce those swings in indirect rate that uh, cause our budget to go, you know, high, ne high negative or high positive. Um, so any questions on the budget? Um, and then- um, Hey, Charlie. The yes, sir. Look, I, I'm just thinking as you said that for folks who are new, I'm not sure <laughs> if everyone understands what you're talking about with the swings. If maybe you can, you can, in a in a 30 second explanation if that's possible <laughs> all right so 10 minutes later yeah. um here's my 30 second explanation and you can kind of see it in the table down at the bottom of the budget 
um, where like the last or FY18, FY19, we were minus 20 and minus 50, 52,000. You see in FY17, we were plus 85, 86,000, plus 42,000 in FY16. If you go back two more fiscal years, the swings are even bigger. Um, and so we're really um, trying to reduce the swings. Um, and it's, a, it's in a two year cycle. So if you see it go up one year, two years later, it'll go down. Um, and we're just trying to close in, close to get closer to zero over time. Um, and sorry, Mike, the, the indirect rate is just the federal Sorry, Our indirect rate is what VTRANS reimburses us for our over reasonable overhead expenses to execute our mission on yep. transportation planning. And not just VTRANS, VTRANS yeah. is the approving agency, but we it's use the same rate economy. for all of our contracts. And it's really, we're following a federal uh, rule. Uh, so uh, the federal government set up this system so that we can appropriately bill our, as Jeff said, our kind of kind of our overhead, although technically we'll call it indirect rate, but um, so that we take all those costs that can't be attributed directly to a program and spread them across all programs. And it's a reasonableness um, uh, of those estimates standard. And so it's a cooperative agreement that we have with our state and federal funders. Yeah. And and it's, it's, so we're tr we try to levelize it because we're allowed to, present an analysis that allows us to collect a certain percentage. And if we're off by only a few percentage points, it can be several thousand dollars. And so what happens is, is we can't over collect. So if we overestimate, then the next year we underestimate and we get whipsawed around and, and VTRANS has been, and the, our, our state funders have been very helpful in working with us on this to try to make it so we can have better budget predictability in our reimbursement rates. So we, we've been trying a whole bunch of things because we always seem to be a little bit under or a little bit over, sometimes a lot over, sometimes a little, a lot under. And we're just trying to make it so we don't go into a year where we're sitting there biting our nails because we have to wait another year to get our, what our true costs are because we over collected a couple of years before. Yeah. So, so this has so, been a peeve of the finance committee. Yeah working with the staff and working with our, our state and federal funders. Thanks, Jeff. And, and I would just add any of new um, commissioners who, who want to get a further explanation, why don't you do it offline, uh, either Charlie or Forrest, I will throw you under the bus to explain that to folks, but uh, yeah. Feel free to call anytime you're having trouble sleeping. We'd be happy to open up the indirect rate proposal and walk you through it. Thanks, Charlie, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, it, no, but seriously, are there any uh, questions? Because um, there's a whole a little little bit circular of circular on indirect rates for those of you that have trouble sleeping at night. Um, okay, with no more questions on the budget. Turning to the work program, uh, Richard did uh, put his finger on you know kind of the most significant thing happening in the work program, uh, which is. Um, yes, the budget for uh, the 89 study is definitely increasing as we're digging in deeper and, and trying to accomplish all of our goals. Um, the, uh, so the flip side of that is there are a number of projects and we've had uh, quite a, I say we, I really mean Eleni, uh, had a lot of conversations with a lot of municipal staff uh, to uh, really right size the program and make sure um, that every project is it could be accomplished this year. And there were a number of them that, you know, either the municipality wasn't ready to start or it was taking longer. So we're deferring uh, a handful of projects. Well, I don't even know if it's five, but a few projects into uh, next fiscal year um, and which was really okay with the municipalities. Um, so there, there is quite a bit of change. It's definitely uh, a big, uh, not to swallow, um, but we do want to dig in to that 89 study and make sure we're doing everything we can to uh, address racial equity issues and make sure at the end it is multimodal and addressing our climate and energy goals and safety goals and all those other goals that we have. Um, and I, uh, I always feel like I need to apologize for, to Richard for the fact that 
Some of our descriptions are maybe a little too road centric, uh, but I can assure him and, and all of you that it will be a multimodal effort that addresses all of our ECOS plans at the end, uh, all of our ECOS goals, excuse me, at the end. Um, and so, but it is, it is a big project um, and I, we appreciate the partnership with VTrans. Uh, Amy, there's some part of me that would like to blame VTrans, but um, for some of the growth in the budget, but I won't do that. Um, but I, I do think we are working collaboratively together to uh, really try to figure out the best solutions uh, for all the users of that, and not just the interstate, but of course at the interchange and, and exit 14 is a problem spot in our county. Um, and that's really where we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what can be done at exit 14 to make everything work better. So I'll leave it at that. And that's probably a little bit more 89 study than you wanted, but that's the big picture of what's going on in the work program. In addition to all those um, new projects being added. Okay. Uh, any, any more questions on that? Let me, let me open it first to members of the public if they have any comments or questions at this point that we haven't addressed previously. Richard. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, do you do we have a cap on this, Charlie? Do you have a sense of how much? I mean, the overrun now is a two hundred fifty thousand for the reasons you explained, but that brings us to an eight hundred thousand dollar project. Do you have a sense of some end point here? Uh, is that going to be it at eight hundred thousand, or do you see this continuing to grow? I'm going to let Eleni answer this because I think she'll have a more fun answer than I will. I'm not quite sure about fun answer. Uh, Richard, we don't know yet. I mean, that is the truth. Uh, we are going to try to answer and evaluate all uh, all the kind of, I'm sorry, my, um, my puppy is getting a little frisky here. So I'm just trying to get her down so I can just talk, but she's just like not allowing me to do that. Um, so, um, we are hoping that we're not going to have a lot more overruns, but uh, you know, so we are very confident of how much we need to basically finish this fiscal year. Uh, and then once we move from the evaluation of the uh, interchange um, alternatives for the three, uh, you know, 14, 13, and 12B, and then we move forward into the bundles, which are going to be multi-model bundles. Uh, and then we're going to see how that process goes. But we are hopeful that uh, the interchange evaluation was the big lift. And we are almost there. We're almost there. We are meeting with the advisory committee. We are meeting. We have a lot of meetings now with the technical committee. We're going to uh, meet with the uh, city council. We're going to have public meetings. We're going to meet with the uh, uh, at BIPOC populations and underserved populations. And then in March or April, we'll meet with the advisory committee and we're gonna make a final decision about interchanges uh, as they move into the bundles. So I'm sorry, I mean, it's a long answer to your question, but it's like, uh, we are hoping that we're not gonna have a lot, a lot of overruns, but we don't know yet. Is there an amended scope of work? Will there be an amended scope of work? Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, after this, uh, if the commission votes for the mid-year adjustment, um, and then uh, immediately afterwards, I'm going to just uh, move forward with an amendment of the scope of work. And then if there is going to be another amendment, you can see all that documents. We're going to put everything on the website, and I'm happy to share everything with you too. So you're asking people to vote for an additional two hundred fifty thousand dollars in this scope of work is not yet developed no, and working. No, we are asking for people to vote for one hundred and sixty thousand dollars in addition. And the reasons I can, we can tell you the reasons. I mean, the reasons is that we have uh, done a lot more evaluations on the interchanges, uh, the possible interchanges. Uh, we are looking at a new interchange at 12B. We're looking at the, uh, some uh, Im improvements at 14. Uh, and also we're looking at improvements at 13. So those are the interchanges that move forward into phase two or round two. Um, and then, uh, so based on a lot of questions from our partners, uh, not just us and also VTrans, 
uh, in addition to the advisory committee, we needed to do a lot more evaluation and analyze and create uh, very complex evaluation matrices that is going to take us to, you know, try to answer those questions to take us to the to the place that we can actually, the advisory committee can make a decision. I'm sorry, it's a long-winded kind of like, you know, answer. I'm happy to talk offline with you about the I-89 anytime, uh, but... Uh, and and, and I, I guess I want to throw out there that um, I can't guarantee that it won't be more as we work with the advisory committee and the technical committee, and we look at different bundles and also, um, uh, one key thing that we have in here that's a little different than most studies is this notion of triggering. Like what would have to happen in the world to trigger a particular investment? Uh, that is probably gonna take some more analytical work, you know, to think more about sequencing and or timing and or what, what it is that would trigger it. And I don't know that that may take a little bit more uh, money than we have in the budget for next year as well. Um, but um, you know, we'll, I think we'll have that conversation again in the spring when we talk about the FY22 work program as to, um, and, and that will be, I think uh, at least our intent is to close up the study in FY22 and get it done. Uh, but I think we will have a little bit more budget conversation there. And that, at that point, Richard, we should have a better sense of what the final dollar figure looks like, um, barring any issues that come up uh, that I can't, know about now so uh, we'll we'll have to see how it goes and keep monitoring it thank you okay any other comments from anyone in the public how about folks on the commission jim um i just wanted to verify that all of the changes that we're looking at are the ones that are highlighted in red text? Um, Jim, thanks for bringing that up, Jim. There are um, a few different kinds of changes in that work program document. Um, uh, ones that you see some, might see green highlighted cells. Oh yeah, okay, I see, I see. Yeah, those are usually indicating, um, like I think we tried to highlight the green project name. And if you scroll to the right, um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm, I'm having to look at this in a two-page side-by-side view. Yeah, me too. I, that, I, I, yeah. I just realized that the legend has more things in it. Yeah, so green ones, right, you'll see right. budget yeah. increases. You'll see some pink cells that are right. budget decreases. And then you'll see red text uh, if a description or deliverable changed. Great. Um, All right. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, and then there's, a, there's a, some cells that are yellow, uh, which are still some pending things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's a couple uh, grant possibilities that we know are out there that we don't know if they'll land or not. Jeff. I just wanted the uh, commissioners to know that the finance committee reviewed all these mid course corrections with the executive committee and felt that they were thoughtfully done and appropriate based on the explanations and the, and the specifics associated with each one of the project uh, adjustments. Thanks, Jeff. Anyone else? John. Just a little tidbit of information. I was looking over the documents. I did finally access them, Charlie. Oh, good. Um, and uh, one of the options, I guess, is the decommission, one, uh, decommission I-189. And to the best of my knowledge, which is a few years old now, and roads get built all the time, I-189 is the shortest interstate in the nation. So if we decommission it, we will lose our our status for whatever that is worth. <laughs> I just thought people may find that uh, uh, an enjoyable piece of fun information. <laughs> Thank you for that, John. <laughs> I heard it one at least one laugh, John. <laughs> Anyone else? Charlie mentioned uh, a fun answer. I was trying to comply. <laughs> there you go. Anyone else? Okay, guess not. So this is an action item, I believe. Uh, so is this an MPO or RPC vote? The, this is um, the way our bylaws are written. It's actually both. So we need to actually do two votes: one as an MPO action and one as an RPC action. So we need two motions, Charlie. 
Yeah, yeah. Two separate motions. Okay, so I'll be looking for a motion first for the transportation side, the MPO side. So moved. Second. Jim. Andy, second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, I, I, we don't need to do a roll call, right, Charlie? Just. I don't think so. Not in this virtual okay. environment. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. But make sure if you do object from state. Mr. Chair, if it's not unanimous, you need to call the roll. Okay. So all those in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> Anyone want to abstain? Looks like it was a unanimous yes. So next we need a motion. Um, also move. Okay, Garrett. I'll second. The, and Catherine. Any further discussion? Just to be clear, this is for the RPC side. So all those in favor of the Hello, <laughs> am I off? <laughs> yeah, Mike, we lost your audio for a moment. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was wondering what was going on when no one moved. So <laughs> we were all in suspense. We were wondering <laughs> how that sentence was going to finish. Yeah, really. So that was again unanimous. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, next item we have is the racial uh, equity. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to update the board, um, the executive committee. Um, has continued this conversation and uh, with the consultant. Uh, if you remember back to the November timeframe, we had an RFP out there uh, looking for a partner to help us with the racial equity work. Um, at the, geez, I'm, I think the December executive committee, um, we kind of honed in on uh, the partner uh, Creative Discourse. Um, January, they came to the executive committee meeting uh, with a very, uh, I guess, an early draft of a scope of work. Uh, we had some discussion there, uh, gave them some feedback. They are updating the scope of work. Uh, hopefully, it will be at the February executive committee for uh, approval. Um, and just if I was going to try to characterize the scope of work, uh, really, it's very focused uh, it's a little different than what we were talking about, I think, in, you know, meetings during 2020 in that I think we were very focused on, like, we're going to have a lot of training events. Um, and this team is really coming back and saying, well, it really, we should do some learning. They want to spend a few months understanding us. So that'll probably take up the end of uh, FY21 here. And then moving into FY22, um, I think they're very hopeful that we can have in-person meetings at that time, uh, sometime in the fall. I'm knocking on wood that that is a real possibility um, and that we're able to bring uh, you all, the staff together and bring in uh, BIPOC community members and partner organizations to have more conversations uh, through the fall and then uh, do more implementation work in the spring. Um, and I'm trying to give you a quick summary. It doesn't mean that we won't have some training events um, over the next few months, but um, they were felt that it would be much more effective uh, for us to actually build relationships with uh, more diverse residents in our community than just be you know, kind of trained and, and told what to do. Um, and I think doing a little bit more research that they shared with us um, or, or looking at research that they shared with us uh, I think is a pretty good argument that, um, yeah, we really need to work on those relationship building as opposed to just learning what we should be doing or should not be doing. Um, so I don't know if any members of the executive committee want to uh, update or improve my summary but um, or add to it, but uh, please do. <laughs> I think it was a pretty good summary, Charlie. Anyone have any questions uh, for Charlie? Guess not. 
<laughs> yeah, so the importance of that issue is is not not lost, um, but um, I do think it is a longer, more deliberate uh, track that we'll be on um, you know, over the next 18 months or so. Great. Okay, thanks. Next item is uh, executive director report. Uh, so I think John was referencing a little bit of the memo that was in the packet. Um, so uh, there was a packet. I don't usually have attachments to my update, um, but we did want to, it's been a few months now since we've talked about the 89 study in, in detail with you um, and wanted to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on with this uh, interchange analysis rabbit hole <laughs> that we've gone down. Um, so happy to take any questions um, on that memo if you have any. Um, but that was just a quick update and we are planning to come to the board next month with a fuller presentation as to what's going on. We're also going to be, uh, Chris, heads up, if I haven't given you a heads up, we'll be at the South Burlington City Council both on February 1st and February 15th, I think. Thank you. Um, and as you read that memo, you can tell, you know, the three interchanges that we're doing a deeper dive into are all in South Burlington. Uh, hence our, our uh, why they're getting so much more attention. <laughs> and I guess I have to wonder if I-89, uh, the interstate is completely within South Burlington, if that's also a rarity. <laughs> well, yeah, those three interchanges anyway, right? Yeah, for sure. And 189, you mean? Yeah, 189, did I that's misspeak? Right. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, no, if there are no questions on that. Um, so uh, all hazards mitigation plan, you may remember us talking about this uh, when we did this original UPWP last spring uh, that we thought uh, we might get a contract to work for the state and update all the hazard mitigation plans in Chittenden County. Um, as that went through the procurement process, they ended up uh, selecting an out-of-state uh, national consulting firm to do that work. Um, so we're, um, we won't be the primary contractor on that. Um, and so, you know, they um, valued some technical expertise, which we appreciate um, over the relationships <laughs> with our municipalities, but we expect to be assisting them in some role yet to be defined. Um, and one other side note on that, um, there is a advisory committee on that, uh, that Chris Shaw was the board representative on in the last cycle. Um, we'd like to get a new board rep on that committee. Um, and that work will happen mostly through the course of this calendar year. Um, we don't need that rep tonight, but that'll be an action item for your next meeting, uh, to appoint a rep to that committee. Chris, were you going to say something? I was just going to mention I wasn't I wasn't stepping off because I uh, uh, had a fear of pandemics, which I don't think are entirely the focus, but uh, it's more often the flood and the, the uh, uh, storm events that we have. But I, I, it, it was an interesting exercise, uh, and uh, it's certainly needed as our contingency plans. Uh, so it is a good committee that uh, uh, does good planning work. Uh, so I do recommend it for folks. Yes, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, please think about that for the next meeting if you're interested, or, or email me or, or Dan Albrecht if you're interested in that. Um, draft uh, rail plan. Uh, VTrans has a rail plan that's uh, out there for uh, public review. I think, I, I don't know that I've seen the actual draft. It's probably coming any day now. Um, and uh, that'll be in front of the TAC to provide comments back. Uh, so that's really just to let you know it's out there. If if you want to get involved with this with it, please let us know, um, or talk to your TAC representative. Um, yes, Jim. We definitely get involved because we we Charlotte has had a big issue for a long time. Yep. With the railroads, and so I do want to maintain contact with that, and and would be very interested in being involved. Thank you. And that's another item that would come under hazard, hazard mitigation there, Jim, obviously. So if anybody wanted to help out, I just find my plate is full. I think we're doing uh, reappraisals this year in South Burlington. I think uh, your house probably just shot up another $100,000 there, Charlie, the, the one you sold below. <laughs> I, I, sh I shouldn't have sold it last summer, huh? Darn it. <laughs> that's all those New Yorkers coming in and buying high. <laughs> 
Um, last uh, item for me is um, to let you know, and this is just more of a heads up, the, uh, the, the draft rules for the clean water so service provider are out there for public review. That'll get reviewed at the QAC at their February meeting, and it'll be on your February agenda uh, to uh, look at providing formal comments back to the state on the, that draft rule. And that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Great. Can Thanks, I Charlie. add one, Charlie? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we are curious here at staff if folks would be comfortable with a change in how we put our minutes in the board packet. Um, so right now your board packet gets big, 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 big because all the committee minutes are there at the end of it. We could, as an alternative, on the agenda itself, put hyperlinks directly to the website pages where those minutes exist. It would help us cut down on data, grand scheme of things. The more times we're repeating things on the website, the bigger it gets. Um, but we just thought that might be more convenient and more helpful. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Couple of thumbs up. So um, is a compromise? I, I must be the only one that reads the minutes then. I don't want to go hunt and hack it all over God's creation for minutes. Well, let me, Regina, are you talking about the minutes from the committees or even from our, our minutes? The minutes for the board would certainly still be included in the packet because that's an action item on your agenda. We thought it also would probably make sense to still include the executive committee minutes right there just because that's a direct committee of the board. Um, but we were thinking about TAC, QAC, PAC. Yeah, so uh, if you remember a few years ago. We... Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> so uh, this it's is electronic copy, Regina. I mean, it's not it's, it's Jeff, not Jeff. anybody's skin. Just don't print them out, folks. I got to tell you. That's the only way I know what's going on in this organization is by reading the minutes of all the committees. And I don't want to have to go on and beckon for them everywhere. Hmm. But I'm a dinosaur. I realize that. Charlie, did you want to add something? No, well, <laughs> I, I just was, I was trying to remember, um, you know, I think this was a change in practice of a number of years ago as we were trying to become more transparent and, and, and to Jeff's point, make sure you had the opportunity at least to be aware of what was going on, you know, in the rest of the organization, uh, particularly at those committees. Um, and so I think it just came up as a question and maybe I'll, I'll own, <laughs> I'll own the question was, I was feeling a little bit guilty at how long some of these packets were getting. Um, but I do think electronically, if you, you know, you don't have to scroll to the end, it's really up to you. Um, so yeah, I guess um, we can leave it as is. We can just do the exec committee minutes or we could, you know, make them all links, but. Just give us two documents, one with minutes and then people can ignore it, okay? <laughs> But I don't want to have to go clicking on hyperlinks all over the place to get minutes to committees that sometimes I don't even know where the hell they are unless they're attached to the to the board minutes. And Jim. I will tell you, I my reaction is visceral and negative, as you can tell. Jim, I can definitely understand Jeff's reaction. I can I can feel it. Uh, I guess I, I I feel I don't mind the hyperlinks at all. I think it would make things shorter, but. To Jeff's point, it is electronic. You don't have to scroll down to the end. So given the two options and given that it's not unanimous, I would go with Jeff and say, fine, leave them in. Yeah. And it would be to fine that, to do it the other way. It, to, to add to that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dinosaur along with Jeff. I may not have as visceral a reaction, but I read things when they're in front of me that's easy, uh, simply because there's a lot of things in my life going on. and. Uh, when they're there, I'll read them. If I have to go hunting and pecking for them, there's a good chance I won't. So with, with that in mind, I'd prefer that they be there because I will also stay better informed if it's placed in front of me like that. That's just how I personally function. So, so let, let me ask this. Is everyone okay with keeping it the way it is? Sure. I still think it's easier to click on a link than to scroll down 35 pages, but... Well, I agree with uh, John and uh, Jeff, though, because I read all the minutes because that's how I know what goes on in the other committees. And I don't always, uh, the links don't always work. <laughs> <for me. laughs> okay. Well, I think, uh, Jackie? 
Well, I also read all the minutes and I find it a challenge to read it in one sitting. And I find the 71 pages to be tough to negotiate. So maybe the compromise of that Jeff suggested of two different documents that are attached would, would be, would just make it easier to find out unless there's some trick, I don't know about, you know, marking the pages. I, I still would strongly advocate for having the executive committee minutes in and our minutes in, but make another document with the other minutes and other people can read them at their leisure. I, I'm fine with that. I just don't want, the solution can't be that the commissioners can do more work to do what they have to do. I just, we already are overworked as it is. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll stop doing it and then I'll quit because I won't be effective as a commissioner. Jim. Um, and I just, instead of having two documents, what you could also do is in your agenda, as you list all those minutes, just put the hyperlink right there in the agenda. Mm -hmm. If yeah. someone wants to go to the hyperlink, they can use it or they can scroll down to the document, but that saves the staff creating two separate documents. Yeah, but it, it solves the problem so that you can have it both ways. Yeah, we'll give you either option. Yeah, you can either yeah. link or scroll. Right. right, that's fair. Thank you. Uh, uh, apologies, didn't mean to uh, raise any emotions there. It was just a little honest question of what is most helpful for you all. And apologies for any trouble that you had tonight. Um, <laughs> it happens to be this week that our website host entity has decided to change. <laughs> Where, where our website is hosted. And uh, we were sure there wouldn't be any issues, but I think there might've been a couple little blips that you all had. So apologies for that. Um, and hopefully it was a very momentary thing while we were switching over to a different provider. So thank you for your patience with us. And, and we hardly heard any negative comments, which um, I think there were probably were more than we heard. So thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I think there was a good, uh, question to bring up, good issue to raise. So at least we know where we are. Committee and liaison activities and reports. Those reports are in the packet. Does anyone have any questions or comments about any of those? Jim Donovan. Um, sorry to be talking so much tonight. Uh, under the Act 250 reviews, we've already had discussions on the Bart, uh, Burton proposal. I also had a question for the one that's in Charlotte, you had mentioned that you're looking for more information on that. How does that work? And do you get that back from the applicant, from the board? How do you proceed once you've sent a letter like that? Because I haven't, I haven't seen one that asked for so much information um, like that, at least in my memory. So I'm wondering how do you proceed once you've sent a letter like that? I did the really but, stupid thing of shutting the packet down so but i believe that this was um is the solar for, field yeah and i'm just trying to think of the phase that that project is in i think that was a 45 day notice um, that um I, i'm sorry i can't tell you yeah i can i can try to find it but um so essentially um what we're doing is we're identifying and flagging issues in the mm -hmm. letter. And then when we see them move forward to the next phase, so 45 day notice, typically they're just saying, we will submit an application. Let us know if you have any comments. Then when they do submit the application, that's when we're looking to see if they've provided that information or addressed it in some way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on the committee reports? Jeff, see, I read them too. Okay. Uh, future agenda topics. Charlie, do you want to go through those? Uh, sure. Um, I already mentioned the ones for February, the 89 study update and the clean water service provider rule. Um, and I think let us know, this is your opportunity also to let us know if there's something that we should put on the agenda. And then in March, uh, we have a few things warning the public hearing for the work program, uh, starting on the slate of officers for FY22 and uh, starting the review of the potential FY, I think they're FY23 transportation projects. Um, this year is gonna be a little bit different in terms of reviewing transportation projects from VTrans. Um, 
And, and thanks to VTrans for all the work they're doing. If you've heard us use the acronym VPSP2, um, they're really opening up the process in terms of how they prioritize, but also how they select projects to go in the program. Uh, this will be kind of our first look at potential projects to go into the program. And then it'll come back, I think probably in May for action um, after we hear from the TAC to uh, make a recommendation to VTrans uh, about priorities for projects to go into the work program. So, and, and what they're really doing is they're looking at um, how much capacity in different programs, financial capacity they have, and they're gonna give us a list of projects 150% of that capacity in the, in the in the capital program. So if there were you know enough money for 10 projects, they're gonna give us 15 projects to prioritize. Um, so that'll be a different process. Um, and it's, it's part of uh, this new prioritization system that we're really working on uh, figuring out how it works and making it work better with VTrans. Um, so thanks to VTrans and um, also thanks to Christine, who uh, has been a partner with VTrans in developing all of this. So heads up. Okay. Any one have any topics that they want to throw out there for future meetings? Jim. Again, Jim, again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just to verify legislative updates and how we're doing on all those policy things that we talked about will be coming under the executive direct reports on a monthly basis. Yeah. I expect, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and please, if in, in between meetings, uh, don't feel like you have to wait for the meeting to ask me, like, you know, shoot me an email or give me a quick call. If you have a question or uh, you feel like there's something I should be paying attention to, I'm definitely not paying attention to everything. Uh, Sharon may be doing some of that herself, but uh, uh, yeah, let us let me know if there's anything you want me to pay attention to. Okay, anything else? Okay, hearing none. Members items, other business. Any members items or other business tonight? I see none. I will ask for a motion to adjourn. And before I do that, I thank everyone for showing up tonight and contributing. It was a good meeting. I see that Jeff has not unmuted, so I'll make a motion to adjourn. I can't make a motion. I'm the alternate tonight. Oh, all right. You right. would have been out of here five minutes ago <laughs> if I was making motion. I'll second that I'll make motion. the motion for Jeff. I'll second the motion. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Anyone who wants to stick around? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good night, uh, everyone. Oh, next, next meeting is uh, what? Uh, February... Something. 17th. 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 Okay. See you all then and others Great. at the executive committee.